Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Michelle, can we turn me down just a smidge? Hello? Ben, this is weird. I can see you. <laughs> Where's that camera? Oh, that one. That one is the one right there. Is that new? Yeah, I, I installed that the other we, we got it here. That was the other master cam. I don't know why I lost is that, it. That's a GoPro. It's the Marshall cam. Okay. Kind of Can we go ahead and play the artist slides, please? There we go. So, Deb Ceresco, Ceresco, excuse me. Uh, is from New York. She is part of the Urban Glass community, and she was also uh, the season one winner of Blown Away, the Netflix glass blowing TV show. And so she's here working on a commission for a larger than life skillet. You can see here there is a clear version. They've got in the annealer from yesterday a black version. She's making a cast iron skillet um, with an egg yolk. So today we're working on the handles for the cast iron skillet while Deb is going to begin making the egg once she's solidified which color of yolk she'll be using. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. Deb is over there with the glasses. If you see a cone on the t-shirt, that's a Museum of Glass staff. So Deb is a visiting artist. Good morning. Oh, wow. Welcome back. So I was not here yesterday. It was Walt, but We've got a smaller version right here. And this is clear. This is like step one, we did a clear prototype. Step two was to make the pan in black. Step three, which is today, we are making handles in the center. And the egg yolk, Deb is constructing over in the corner.
So right now, Ben is working on sculpting this larger part. The part that's attached to the pipe is this junction right here. No. That is one way that it could happen. However, with something this large, it's going to be easiest for everybody to do a cold connection. And what you're referring to is a hot connection. So it'll be glued on. You can see Kristen has a flannel right there. She's our cold worker here at the museum. And she will be um, sculpting the handle end and the ledge here so that there's a seamless connection. And then she'll use a glue called Hextall to attach the two. It's a crystal clear glass specific glue, yes. Hey, Michelle, can we have the concept drawing on the board, please?
Ms. Michelle.
Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Museum of Glass. For those of you just coming in, we have visiting artist Deb Ciresco. She hails from New York. She was the season one winner of Netflix's Blown Away glass blowing series. Today we're working on some larger than life skillets. Yesterday we made the pan. For reference, this is what I'm referring to. Cast iron skillets, yesterday we made the pan. Today we're working on the handles in the center bench and on the far bench we are working on the egg and the yolk. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? So this is an example of what we're planning on making. So in the center, we've got that handle. You can see that Ben is now sculpting that inside hole. That is an egg, yes. And so the eggs are happening over yonder. Right now, Deb is sculpting the yolk of the egg, the um, yellow portion. She, she will sculpt that, she will put it inside the garage, and then she'll begin to make the egg white. Yeah. I, that's an excellent question. I'm not entirely sure why the handle is so long. I do not think that the handle will be that proportion. Today we're making the handle. So that hole that they're working on right now is. Yes. Yeah. So we. Yeah. 
Yeah, we made the pan yesterday, and today we're working on this part. So you can see the hole that is what they're sculpting here, and they're elongating it. So the tools that are in Ben's hands, they're called corks. So it's cork with a wooden backing. And you can see that there are some sparks flying. That's the cork um, catching fire. Does anyone have any other questions for me? So the question is about the combustion systems on the floor. So our torches are ran with uh, propane and air. So we've got propane lines going through the bottom and they're plugged into that red box. The question is, how are we going to make the handle smaller? Let me grab something. So smaller is not the vibe we're going for. This is the size of the glass object, right? So that handle is proportionate because we're making it massive. Go big or go home. The question is about the architecture of the cone. The cone is referencing a mugwomp, which is a traditional timber mining uh, apparatus. In order to make this unique, we're at a 17 degree tilt. And it's in reference to the timber industry, which is a vital part of Tacoma and how Tacoma came to be such a metropolitan area. The question is the classic, has anyone ever gotten burnt? Yes, you get burnt, but it's typically when you're a novice glass blower and everyone here on the floor has been blowing, blowing glass for at least 20 years.
Hello and welcome to the museum. For those of you just coming in, today we have visiting artist Deb Chiresco, hailing from New York. Some of you might remember her from season one of Blown Away, where she was the winner. For those of you unfamiliar with that series, it's on Netflix. It's a glass-blowing reality British Bake Off vibe, but for glass. Mm -hmm. And we, yesterday we made massive larger-than-life skillet pans, and today we're working on the handles here in the center bench. And Deb, who has the all-black outfit, very similar to mine, is uh, making the eggs. The eggs. Can we go ahead and show the commission slide, please? Here's an example. Right, so the egg is kind of falling out of that pan. So right now we're doing um, some R&D, making sure our yolk is the right color, trying to get the right density of white. And for reference to scale in which we're working, over on that cart is a pan that's similar to the size, so we're working massive. The one that we're using is black, which is why the handle will be black, but that's still in the annealer from yesterday, so it'll be a few hours before we're able to handle that. So the question is uh, about the cracked annealer. So for thicker work, I was told about 220 degrees, we're able to crack it. The critical point for glass is about 720 degrees. The closer you are able to wait and get down to room temperature, the better, the glass is gonna be happier. But any, any point between about 300 degrees to 200 degrees, you're able to crack it and it'll crash slowly. We didn't full-blown open it, right? So we just cracked it. And remember, one of those reasons is because we need to get that skillet out so we can put the handle up next to it to make sure it matches. Correct. Correct. If you're still around in about two hours, you'll probably see it. Yep. Yep. No worries. Sounds good to me. Hello, welcome. Did you have a question? So we're not doing any hollow work today. That is solid, solid glass. It's three layers of clear, three dips of black powder, one scrape gather of clear on top. The question is, shouldn't they be wearing protective pants so they don't hurt themselves? It's about 85 degrees over here, so it's also very uncomfortable to be that hot. And typically you're not burning yourselves on the bottom half, and if you are, you ask your assistant to shield you, which is basically use a piece of wood to make sure I'm not burning. The 
question is, why don't they wear gloves? Sometimes when you're working really large and you need to get close to the glass, gloves are absolutely appropriate. However, if you think about the rotations that they're doing on the pipe, if you constantly wear gloves, you will get friction burns. So you got to pick your poison. So for those of you who can see, Deb is now taking a gather out of our furnace. Thanks, Michelle. A gather is the... Hmm. Action of getting more glass on the outside layer of the glass you've already got. So what she did was she put her pipe in with the inside glass that's already been colored to that yolk color, and she put a layer of clear on top of that. Now Deb is using a newspaper that's been soaked in water. What happens is when the newspaper comes into contact with that glass, a layer of steam develops, which stops it from carbonizing quickly. You can see that it does, the water evaporates, and then we do have some carbonization, but it helps with that. And this is a way for a glass maker to achieve a more organic shape. Hi, welcome to the museum. For those of you just coming in, we have visiting artist Deb Cheresco, who's, com who's finishing up a commissioned piece here at the museum. Deb is from New York, and she was season one winner of Blown Away. To give you an example of scale of the piece we're working on, that is our initial prototype, that clear pan it's a skillet, right, cast iron. Uh, and today we're working on handles that will later be cold connected to the pan. And Deb is sculpting some eggs.
So that material that Ben is using to sculpt on is called a kiln shelf, named as such because it's a shelf that you would typically put in a kiln. It's a refractory material that has a high heat absorbency rate. We sculpt on kiln shelf when we want it to not be a huge heat sink. What Deb is doing is she's gathering up white glass powder for the egg white. For those of you just coming in, welcome to the museum. Right now in the center bench, we are working on handles for a larger than life cast iron skillet. Over in the corner, we have visiting artist Deb Churesco sculpting eggs that will be inside the skillet. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? So for those of you just coming in, here is a reference to what we are completing today. We have visiting artist Deb Churesco here from New York who asked the museum to help her with this commission for a larger than life skillet. This will eventually be in a, a client's house in San Francisco, <clears throat> California. So yesterday, the team was able to accomplish the skillet pan. You can see a clear version over there. The one that we'll be using is actually black. In the center bench, we're working on handles. And over in the corner, we've got components for the egg that'll be dripping out of the pan. Is there anything else? Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Just want to say hi. Welcome. Thanks for coming and watching this process and watching me here today and the team. It's been awesome. So over here, you can see that Courtney is hanging out with that wad of white glass. That's because we're going to be going back into the furnace and taking another dip or gather. It's the process of going into our 1,000 pound crucible and gathering more glass, putting another layer of glass on top of that. We really want a cold core. Cold is. Uh, relative here, right? All of the glass on the hot shop floor is at least 1,000 degrees. So we want that nice cold core so that when we go inside the furnace, all the glass doesn't schlup off. So right now here in the center, Ben is building up heat on the punty, and that's so that he can put thermal shock properties to use. So what we do is we build up the heat on the back end closest to the pipe, and then we introduce something cold, like the water in the block bucket behind him, and that ensures that the glass cracks exactly where we want it, right at that jack line. Here, Deb is coming out. She's taking that fresh dip. Although the glass does look bright orange, white, or yellow, it is clear. This is called a strip gather. She's stripping off any extra glass that she doesn't need. And now she's doing it one better, and she's scraping that extra clear glass. This ensures that we have the smallest layer of clear we can get away with. Right, so she's used that marver to push all the clear that she just gathered up to the front. She's using her jacks to isolate the extra clear that we don't want to use. And then she'll come in with the diamond shears and trim off that clear. They're called diamond shears because they have a diamond-shaped blade in the center of the cutting tool area. The question is, how hot does the glass get? Our furnaces run at 2350, that's 2350 degrees. Excuse me. Our furnace runs at 2100 degrees. Our glory holes run at 2300 degrees. So at any point in time, the glass can be between 1000. Remember, that's our breaking point. We don't want to drop. And then at its highest viscosity, which is molten from the furnace, our furnace heat about 2100.
that's a, um, not as simple of a question. So we did that scrape gather, right? We scraped all that clear off. That clear is pure clear. We can recycle it. As soon as we introduce color, we cannot recycle it because it could contaminate our furnaces. So saving that two pounds of colored glass versus contaminating a thousand pounds in the furnace, it doesn't weigh out. So they're about to break this piece off. Can we have eyes in the center? Right, so we built up that heat right at that punty. Gabe is wearing Kevlar gloves. This allows for him to touch the glass. Now we're introducing water in the, the tweezers. Vibrations are then sent up the pipe and we are able to put that in the annealer. Can we go ahead and give them a round of applause? It's the first thing in the annealer today. Into the annealer it goes, and over a course of about eight and a half hours, that will slowly come to room temperature. That furnace, or excuse me, that annealer that we just opened up, those are the pans from yesterday. They're still too warm to touch, but we're able to open the doors even larger than they were before. Our furnace is run on natural gas and pro natural gas and forced air. Can we go ahead and play the furnace slide? Here is the anatomy of a glass blowing furnace, right? We've got our ceramic pot that lines that makes direct content with our contact with our molten glass. We've got the door that you can see on either side, and then there's a whole bunch of different refractory materials on the inside making up um, to make it as insulated as possible. And then we've got this right. steel shell and the aluminum outer. It's all to make sure that heat stays nice and in there. We've got our gas burner, our airline, and our flue that takes the bad stuff out. Uh, it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we've got two furnaces on the floor, each hold about 1,000 pounds of clear glass. We only melt clear here. Thanks, Michelle.
So the question is about the anatomy of the pipe and why we don't have a lot of heat transference going up the pipe. There is about seven inches of solid steel at the very end. That's what we're gathering the glass on. It then translates into tubing. And because the tubing is thinner than the solid steel, we have less heat transference. The glass is, or the pipe is always hottest after we come out of that furnace when it's exposed to that radial heat right here. And then we go over to the pipe cooler, which is essentially a water fountain that cools down that pipe. For those of you who are interested in when glass makers burn themselves, they don't burn themselves on glass because it's obvious that's hot. You burn yourself on that pipe because it's less obvious. So it's always in good practice when you're noticing that heat is getting built up into that steel that you go over to the water cooler, especially when you're working on a team-based project because you know, you know it's hot, but if someone comes up and doesn't, that's not cool. So for those of you who have been here a while, we started off making the yolk of the egg. It's hard to tell here, but the yolk is actually that orange dot you can see in the center. So we made that yolk, we boxed it in our garage, kept it nice and warm, right? The garage is where we go to park the glass. We keep it above that threshold of breaking and below that threshold of getting goopy. We parked it in the garage and then we were able to then use that yolk as kind of a punty, and now we've got our egg white and our yolk. Nick just brought over a metal jig. We're gonna use this metal jig to simulate the curvature of the pans that we made yesterday. Why don't you just use the pans from yesterday? Because that would cause thermal shock and we would break them, and we don't wanna do that. So that steel is cold to that glass, so he's building up that heat. Also, when glass is exposed to something very cold, you get something called chill marks. We don't want chill marks either, so we're gonna go ahead, preheat that metal, and then we'll use this jig in order to simulate that curvature. Meanwhile, over here, Gabe is starting the second handle of the day. He's rolling clear glass inside black powder. He'll do this at least three times to build up a density that is relative to the density of the pans that we made yesterday.
I got distracted. It's so exciting to me. I love this. I've never seen that before. Does anyone have any questions for me? So glass has this funny way of breaking when you only make one, uh, right? Always. Uh, so we have two skillets inside the annealer. We will be making parts for those two skillets all day, just in case. One. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, the only one. Yes. Can we go ahead and give Deb a round of applause? We got the first egg boxed. Look at her go. All right. So that is known as the happy dance. That's when we're able to box things. It's great. So for those of you who missed it, we have visiting artist Deb Churesco from New York. She was season one of Blown Away winner. She is here as our visiting artist working on a commission for a client in San Francisco. So that's what happens when you drink Seattle coffee. Tacoma's, I mean, I'm from New York.
So what Gabe is doing now is that's another scrape gather. He gathered glass. Now he's scraping off all the excess clear. For those of you just coming in, welcome to the Museum of Glass. Today we have visiting artist Deb Churesco from New York working on a commission piece. You can see they're having a little powwow over yonder. What they're talking about is the proportions of the handle to the skillet. They're using a clear prototype as an example. We made the clear prototypes before Deb arrived, so she would have something to look at. And inside that annealer behind Courtney are the two black pans that we will be using for the commission. So today the game plan is to make handles and eggs. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? Here is an example of what the finished product will look like. This will eventually be hung in a client's home in San Francisco, California. In the middle, we've got Gabe, who's starting the next handle. Does anyone have any questions for me? The question is about recycling glass. As soon as there's color in the glass, we cannot recycle it because we would contaminate the rest of the glass in our furnace. We've got two furnaces, each hold 1,000 pounds of glass. So to save about a pound of glass versus contaminating 1,000 doesn't weigh out. But if it is clear, like the clear glass that was scraped off of Gabe's um, piece, we can recycle that. As soon as glass is melted for the first time and is no longer particulate, it is called cullet. So we add, when we refill the furnace, also known as charging the furnace, we use a mixture of cullet, so pre-melted glass, and batch, which is the particulate matter that makes up glass.
The question is about the visiting artist program we hear at the museum and how cold working works into that. Every year, the Museum of Glass invites artists from any genre, any medium, to apply to be a visiting artist. If you are lucky enough to be awarded a visiting artist slot, you either get three days or six. And within that slot, you get eight days of cold working provided from the museum. No, the tilt of the cone does nothing for our glass. Uh, it is, the architecture is based off of the traditional timber wig, let me, I always forget this word. It's based off of a waste wood burner, which is the traditional timbering um, manufacturing uh, architecture uh, because we have such a strong timbering background we wanted to pay homage to that and then we just put it on a tilt for funsies 
There are blueprints up over yonder of our cone. For those of you who haven't been here before, you are able to walk 360 degrees, get a different perspective of the glass making. Um, you know, I highly suggest that for when we get closer to the egg forming process, that's probably going to be a really cool angle. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? So for those of you just coming in, we have visiting artist Deb Churesco working on a commission. This is Deb, for those of you who don't know, season one Blown Away winner. Woohoo! We're so happy that Deb is here, especially because it's Women's History Month here at the museum. Heck yeah. For those of you who have not heard about Blown Away, it is a Netflix series of television um, that features glass blowing, kind of like British Bake Off, but sassy and hot and sticky. It takes place in Canada. You start off with 10 contestants, you end up with one. It's a dog eat dog world. Deb was top dog. Yes. And for those of you who are familiar with Blown Away, and Women's History Month. We will have one of the judges from Blown Away, Catherine Gray, here in the amphitheater next week. She is also our featured artist for our Red Hot Gala. Any other questions for me? So right now in the center bench, Ben is working on getting the general shape of the next handle. Inside that annealer over yonder, we've got the two skillets we worked tirelessly on yesterday. And today we're working on our final components. We've got the skillet handles in the center bench. And we've got the egg yolks being gaffed by Deb herself. Can we have eyes on Deb, please? So Deb is using what's known as a wooden block in order to sculpt the yolk. The process is, is we make the yolk first. We put it inside our garage so that we're able to kind of press pause. We park the glass in that garage. That garage keeps the glass warm enough that it doesn't shatter, but not so hot that it's moving around, wiggling. So we'll finish sculpting this yolk. It'll go inside the garage, and then we'll start the egg white process. And then we will be combining the two here in the hot shop. So for those of you who saw the first handle get boxed away, we're making it very differently this time around, right? So the piece that Ben just squished on that kiln shelf, I'm making assumptions here, but I'm pretty sure that's the part that will be attached to the skillet. So we're making it backwards from before. Now Deb is letting that core cool, because remember we need to do another gather of glass. Can we show the Gather slide.
Come on out, have it. Don't be slow. All right, now Deb has let that core cool. Remember our temperatures are relative, that glass is at least still 1,000 degrees. And we're gonna be going side, inside one of our 1,000 pound furnaces. That furnace is melting glass at 2,100 degrees. The, the size of the glass in which she went in with and the rate in which she turns determines how much glass that she gathers. Now she's stripping off any extra clear, and then she'll take it one step farther and scrape off the remaining clear that is stuck on there. We want as thin of a layer of clear on the outside as possible. The question is, what happens when glass accidentally falls in one of our reheating furnaces? And sometimes that does happen. It happens less frequently here at the museum. But you take a rod and you scrape it out. There's also a technique with some glass makers where they put a layer of kitty litter at the bottom to help catch all of the glass. I don't believe that that is what they do here. They call it a diaper, so it gets even more romantic. So the tools in Ben's hand are called corks. It's natural cork with a wood backing to help give it some rigidity. It also allows for him to hold on to those wooden handles. You can see in real time that glass that was once orange is fading closer to its true color, which is black. And that's because as the glass is exposed to the room temperature air, it is cooling. And that is one of the ways we can tell what temperature the glass is. Whether it's orange, it's going to be moving a lot more. And when it's closer to its true color, it's going to be stiffer.
So Deb is right now setting herself up to break off this yolk eventually. So we've isolated that mass. That round bulbous form will be our yolk. And then she's cinched in that neckline that will eventually be attached to our egg white. But for now, we just need to focus on keeping it nice and warm so it'll be parked in our garage until we get that egg white to the point where we're able to attach the two together. Meanwhile, over here, we're just about ready to punty this bad boy up. This is called a price check. We have very technical terms here, making sure it fits. So some of you might be asking, well, why don't we just attach to the handle to the skillet now? We're basically there already. If we were to physically touch that room temperature pan to our handle right here, it would absolutely shatter. And that is thermal shock would happen. And we would also get the handle stuck to there. It'd be like, uh, I don't know, a really unattractive gum to your shoe, right, deal. And then they would both eventually break. So on both sides, we have the same thing about to happen, which is we're going to punty up both our skillet and our yolk. We've now attached our punty. The punty gives us the opportunity to sculpt the glass from the opposite side. So right now we're letting that punty settle up or stiffen up, get hard, so that when we break it off the, the structural end right now, it won't flop onto the ground. It's really critical that our punty is the right temperature, our yolk is the right temperature, everything needs to be harmonious. Now we're adding that water to that hot glass, causing it to break. This is the thermal shock. Vibrations are then sent up the pipe that ensure that the glass breaks exactly where we want it to. Does anyone have any questions for me? The question is about our staff here at the Museum of Glass. We have four main gaffers. Ben Cobb, who is our Hot Shop director, he's sitting at the bench. We have Sarah Gilbert, who is at the reheating furnace. We have Gabe. And we have Nick, who also is the metal worker here at the museum. He will be making the stand for the commission at the end. And he's also jigged up the yoke apparatus, the jig. Uh, they're all full-time employees here at the museum. Um, everyone on the floor has been blowing glass for at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, we do have visiting artist Deb. And then with her, we have a local hot shop glass maker, Courtney. So he uh, is from to, uh, Seattle, not full time here, but does work on a part time freelance basis.
And for those of you curious about how the handle will be attached to the skillet, in the blue over yonder is Kristen. She is the cold worker here at the museum. Cold working is a terminology that's, you know, like many American things, it's cold. Um, so we use water and diamond and uh, abrasives to sculpt the glass. It's a secondary process. So she will be the one to put all of the pieces together. You can't see it here, cold working um, is a very solitary sport, unlike glass blowing, which is a team sport. But behind here, Kristen does have her cold shop where she's able to um, use various pieces of equipment to assist in visiting artists and work for herself. Can we go ahead and put up the commission slide, please? For those of you just coming in, this is the goal of today. Yesterday, we worked on the pan part of our skillet. Today, we're working on handles in the middle bench. And in the corner, we have visiting artist Deb Churesco creating our eggs. Thanks, Michelle. So right now, Deb is gathering up clear glass in order to make the egg white. We've already made the yolk. It's a nice bulbous form. Courtney has it at the garage. Remember, we have to keep it hot enough so that it doesn't shatter. The question is, how long does it take to make a glass sculpture? And that really varies upon the complexity of the sculpture you're trying to make. So yesterday was 10 to 5, and they made two pans. So, and then all day today. So quite a bit of time, especially considering we've got such a large team here.
So right now, Ben is using those diamond shears in order to create a little nubbin. That'll give him a spot to pull. So right now, we are getting the center of that glass really nice and hot, so we're able to create the opening in the handle. So we're using the hot torch in order to build up that heat so we can move that glass around. Over in the corner, we've got Courtney rolling in the glass powder. This is our white powder. He'll be doing that four to five times to build up a nice density of that color.
The question is, at what point do glassmakers mm, learn about safety in the hot shop? It's pretty customary to get burned or to accidentally, you know, have something happen. But that's typically when you're a novice and you don't know what's going on. It's taught, number one, glass is hot. Do not touch the glass. It's when you're kind of testing yourself to uh, how much you're able to withstand that things kind of happen. But you can see that they're working in tandem. They're working as a team. At any point when the glass is felt to be hot, you've got a paddle, you've got a shield, and you work together to make sure that the exposure to the heat is minimized. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's similar to in the service industry where you're a, a waitress or a waiter and you, you get accustomed to staying behind you. And it's always like when you're coming out of that glory hole and someone's right behind you, so it's customary to uh, you know, announce that. And it also becomes second nature to realize where the glass maker is going to go next to predict that movement and to get out the way. So the, the structure, the team structure, is you've got a gaffer, who's kind of the boss, and then you have assistants. And so Deb is the gaffer at the side bench, Ben is the gaffer in the middle bench, and they're orchestrating the moves, and communication is key, especially in the hot shop, about what is to happen next. Now, they've been working together for quite some time, so they also have that history of working together. Um, this is the first time that Courtney and Deb, from, from what I've understood, have worked together so they're using common courtesies and open communication in order to make sure that there aren't any accidents. We have three holes here at the Tacoma Museum of Glass. We've got the corner, we've got the center, we've got the other corner. We can absolutely have all three open. We would need one more person, most likely. Mm -hmm. And that's up to the gaffer. For those of you who are curious, Gabe just set up one of our skillets from yesterday. Do we want the light on or off? Was that better or worse? No difference? Great, I'll just leave it on then. Now it's a big black hole. So eventually our egg that we've been sculpting here is going to fit inside this skillet. It kind of drips off. Um, and in the center here, we're making that handle, right? For those of you who are curious about the sheen and the shine, it is my understanding that it will be shiny at the end. Now we're really making moves with this egg white over here. Deb is letting that core cool, because remember we need to do that scrape gather. We need to get as thin of a layer of clear on top of that white glass as possible. This is called encasing. We are encasing the colored glass. So for those of you who are curious about that heat radiating up that pipe, Deb just did a pre-cool before she goes inside that furnace. She cooled down that pipe, and it's essentially a water fountain that's foot-operated that allows for us to cool the pipe intermediately between the process so that we don't burn ourselves on the pipe. It's safe to assume that the glass is hot at any given point, but that pipe that's when we kind of get burned because we assume it's cold and then it turns out it's not.
There's two skillets because when you only make one, it will always break. You want to cover. You want to cover your bases. And what Gabe said was they tried for four to land on one. Deb Churesco just came out of that furnace. She's doing her initial strip inside our strip bucket. Now she'll begin the scraping process. She has the pipe at a tilt, and she's literally scraping, pulling that pipe away to get that extra clear off of there. The question is, the stuff that we're bonking off into this top loading annealer is the terminology. This will stay in here. This is done. So when we've filled the annealer completely, over the course of eight and a half hours, it will come down from about 950 degrees to room temperature. This is called the annealing process. If we fill number three, we'll go back in there. So that is open because that's where we box the stuff from yesterday. And we need to get that stuff back out on the floor so we make sure our handles and our eggs all vibe. So Deb is using a very high-tech tool right now. It's a newspaper that has been soaked in water. So Deb Churesco just put in our jack line. The jack line helps us to isolate the glass at the end of the pipe and leaving the glass on the one side. This is all in preparation for flattening out that egg white so that we can then attach the yolk. So once that 
yolk becomes attached, I highly recommend making moves over up there. I think that's going to be the best viewpoint. Just saying that. Hello and welcome to the museum. Right now we have visiting artist Deb Churesco here in our Hot Shop Amphitheater. Right now is a very exciting part happening over here in the corner. We will be attaching our egg white and our egg yolk together. We will then be shaping them using a metal jig to simulate the curvature of our pan that we made yesterday. In the middle, we've got the Hot Shop team working on the handle that will later be attached as well. So right now, Nick is getting that yolk really nice and juicy, so we are able to dr drip it and make it flat. Simultaneously, Courtney is planning his yolk attachment, so he's making sure the yolk is at the right temperature to successfully adhere. Oh, no, you're good. Right now, Deb is using a paddle to help smush that glass. To an extent, every glass maker is a pyromaniac. We live for the fire, the heat, the drama. Here we are attaching that yoke. They smoosh it on there to make sure that it's successfully attached because now that yolk is holding that egg white.
Now remember that glass is super hot. I, if I had to take a guess, it's uh, at about 1400 degrees. And now we'll be using the jig that Nick constructed in order to simulate that slope. Visiting artist Deb Teresco is now using corks to help drape that yoke over. We're allowing gravity to help us out. We want that hot glass to contour to our skillet. It's cool, right? Oh, and they just boxed our second handle. If we can give them a round of applause, that would be awesome. And so our egg has been formed to the point where now we're working on finessing. Now, some of you might wonder, why did we encase the color in clear? Why, why would you put that clear on there just to scrape most of it off? That's because clear is more forgiving. So if we were to heat the hot torch onto that color, we could burn the color and it would be pretty unattractive. So by encasing it in that clear, we're able to get the optical qualities that we desire for this piece. So right now, Deb Churesco is building up that heat right at that punty because we're just about to the point where we're going to be able to break that off. You can see Courtney is all suited up. He's got Kevlar gloves. He's got a face shield. He will be physically loading that egg into this top loading annealer here shortly. This process is called flashing down the piece. When the piece goes inside the reheating furnace, it's called a flash. And what we're doing is we're getting all of that glass to about 1,000, 1,100 degrees, and we don't have hot spots. If we were to load it too soon, we would melt to the kiln. So it's very mm, important that we get that temperature right. Now she's using her jacks to cut in right where we want it to break. Now water is loaded into the tweezers, and that will create thermal shock where we've got our glass, it's really nice and hot, it's pretty upset. And the water essentially seals the deal where it, it's gonna break right where we want it to. Vibrations are then sent up and it breaks off. Can we go ahead and give visiting artist Deb Churesco a round of applause? The second egg of the day. You got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. We're well on our way. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our visiting artist, Deb Teresco, she is season one winner of Blown Away. We are so happy to have her here all the way from New York. Thank you all for being here, really appreciate it. Thank you for the wonderful, warm reception. I really appreciate everyone. Felt really good. Feel the love. Follow me on Insta, DCZE. So we're gonna go ahead and make an egg rolling on to the next one. I'm sorry, I'm really having fun with this egg thing.
Does anyone have any questions for me while we get ready for the next handle and egg? So we've got a couple of different pieces of equipment here on the hot shop floor. Our furnace, we've got two. They run at 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. They are powered by natural gas and forced air. And we run them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our reheating furnaces, also known as glory holes, run at 2300 degrees. It's how we keep the glass really nice and hot. Remember, the glass can't fall below a certain threshold, otherwise it will crack and break. So yesterday we made the pans. We've got two on display. So the egg and the handle will eventually be attached to one of these. Um, this is a commission piece. So only one will be completed. But if you only make one, it will break. So we got to make at least a couple to feel good about ourselves. So that's why even though we've only got two pans, we've already boxed two handles and two eggs. We're just going to keep on rolling for the rest of the day, making parts. Yeah. So we've got two handles and two eggs. It is 1218. We take a break at one. So we'll make one more. Probably six total, six sets. a whole lot of heat, right? So um, here at the Museum of Glass, we use spruce pine batch. It's one of the manufacturers of glass in the United States. It comes from spruce pine, North Carolina. Uh, it comes to us in the form of particulate. We then load that particulate into the furnace, and over the course of four to six days, the glass fines out, which means the particles all melt together and are cohesive and are happy. It's when we are charging the furnace that we're able to actually recycle the clear glass. As soon as glass is melted, it becomes cullet. That's the technical term. So we use a combination of recycled cullet and particulate to refill our furnaces. So Deb Churesco is known for her egg making. To ask her how many eggs she's made, I, I mean, it'd be a bunch. It'd be way a bunch. So, so we're just making what she's already um, perfected in a larger scale. Up on the board, you can see um, examples of previous works. I expect none to break. Uh, because um, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. One will be too long, one will be too short, one will have a hole on not where I like it. So to have the choice to be able to make it exactly the way you want is critical. We also made the first handle far differently than we made the second. The first handle was never punnied up, it was made off the pipe the first time. The second handle was puntied up, which gave us more freedom to sculpt from both sides. The question is, what do we use to color the glass? Glass color comes to us in three forms. The primary form is color bar, which is a bar of color concentrate. We used to have several manufacturers across the world. Now we still have those three manufacturers, Kugler Color, Gaffer Glass, and Reichenbach, that are all manufactured in Germany and then imported 
to America. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we are spoiled because we have Olympic Color Rods, which actually is a distributor for all three of those manufacturers of color. They all make slightly different variations of color. If we're not using Color Bar, we're using Frit or Powder. You can see that they are roll Gabe is rolling into powder that is inside that sheet pan, right? So we take the Color Bar, we break it down, then it becomes Frit. We break down the frit even farther, it becomes powder. So it all starts from that bar. And it, what determines the type of frit it is is based on the size of the particle of glass. So today, we heated up the kiln one time. We got it up to about 950 degrees, and it'll coast there. And as we finish pieces, it'll go inside that annealer, and at the end of the day, or when the annealer is full, whatever comes first, it'll be sent down, and over a period of eight and a half hours, it will go from 950 to room temperature.
For those of you just coming in, welcome to the museum. Today we've got visiting artist Deb Teresco from New York visiting us. We're working on a commission that she received for a giant larger than life cast iron skillet with an egg. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? Here is an example of what we're running with. So this morning we are making handles for one of our skillets. We will be spending the afternoon making the other handle. This includes the eggs. So in the center bench we are making the long handles and Deb is, Deb Teresco is sculpting the eggs for our pieces. Thanks Michelle. Over here we've got um, our egg yolk that is chilling. We want a nice cold core so that we can go in and get another gather of glass. Over here in the center we have the handle. We've already applied all of the black color and now we have a skin of clear on the outside so we've encased that handle. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to ask. I am here as your hot shop guide. Think of a honey pot. The question for those of you who did not hear, how do we get the glass on the rods? Think of a honey pot. And so you take your honeycomb or your pipe and you swirl it around and you're able to pick up that honey. The question is, once all the pieces are made, how do we connect them? And we've got a wonderful cold worker who will be attaching them um, in a secondary process. So she'll be fitting all the pieces and then using a glass glue to attach them all. Thanks for stopping by the museum.
So the question is, how did the commission come about? And visiting artist Deb Churesco has been making meat-themed work for quite some time, made most famous through the Blown Away series, where she won season one. Um, and she was approached by a private client to make this at that scale. Whoopsies. <laughs> uh, so you can see um, it's actually the clients over there. So they're here orchestrating, assisting Deb to orchestrate the making of the piece. So right now, Deb has isolated the yoke onto that initial punti. We will then be attaching the punti rod to it. So Courtney is about to get the punti started. He's warming up the pipe. He will then do a small gather of clear glass, which will eventually be attached to the top side of the yoke, which will allow for us to attach the part that's currently on the pipe to the white of the egg. Can I have a show of hands for anyone who has seen Blown Away? Awesome. Some of you might remember Deb Churesco from season one. She was our winner. For those of you unfamiliar with the Blown Away series, uh, it's like the British Bake Off show where you start off with 10 and then every uh, episode you're emotionally torn. Uh, there's always a villain, there's always a, a, a victim, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, you've got one winner, and that was Deb.
Here in the center bench, we are sculpting handles for the skillets that we made yesterday. For reference, we've got one skillet pan over on that pedestal. We have the other skillet pan here. This is a cast iron skillet we're referencing this from. So what Ben is sculpting that handle on is called kiln shelf. It's a refractory material that allows for us to sculpt the glass without getting it too cold. In his hand is a cork. That's a natural cork that's attached to a wooden handle. And so now we've finalized that yoke. It will be put into our garage. The garage is where we go to park the glass. We press pause. The garage keeps the glass warm enough so that it doesn't shatter, but not so warm that it's super malleable. Meanwhile, Deb will start the egg white. Think about this, everybody. Fried, poached, or hard boiled. At the end of this egg, I wanna, I wanna show of hands who likes which egg better. This is very important stuff. Very hard to distinguish what is the best egg. At the end of the egg, Ben, you're shooting the gun. For those of you just coming in, welcome to the museum. Got quite the group. So for those of you who just missed um, the survey, Deb just asked, it's at the end of this egg, she wants to know what your favorite type of egg to eat is, poached, hard boiled, or fried? That's what I was kind of thinking too. Or scrambled, I'll go ahead and say that's an option. No scrambling? It's, it's okay to have that in the survey? Cool. I literally brought quiche for lunch today. It's like, I want egg pie. No. So for those of you who don't know who Deb Ceresco, Churesco, sorry, that name always slips my mind. Uh, 
For those of you who don't know who Deb Cheresco is, she is season one winner of Blown Away. She hails from New York and has her own glass practice in New York City. She's very well known for her, her meat-based glass pro projects, such as bacon, eggs, um, and other installations. Today at the museum, we're working on a commission piece. Can we go ahead and play that commission slide? Here's a look at what we are completing today. On both of these pedestals, you can see the pans that we made yesterday. Today we're focusing on the handles of the skillet. So in the center bench, we're making the back handle and later this afternoon, we'll be making the front handle. Over on the side here, we have Deb Churesco making the egg. So right now, Deb Cheresco is gathering up a bunch of clear glass so that she has enough for her egg white. For those of you who missed it, we did already put in the garage our yolk. So now we've switched gears onto the egg white. What we're doing now is we're allowing that glass to clear so we have a nice cold core so that when we go back into that furnace, the glass doesn't all fall off. So by having that cold core, we make sure that it stays attached to that pipe. Now Deb Churesco is taking another gather of clear glass from our furnace. Our furnace holds up to 1,000 pounds of glass and runs at a temperature of 2,100 degrees. Over in the side, we're using what's known as a wooden block in order to sculpt that glass. That block lives in water, and what happens is when it's exposed to that molten glass, a layer of steam goes in between that wood and that glass to stop carbon buildup. As that glass is exposed to that hot glass, that water does burn off, and that's why when we know to dunk that block back in the water.
So over in the corner here, Courtney is gathering glass that's pigmented white. It's white powder. He will gather about four to five rolls of that white glass in order to get the density of color we want for the egg. Now Sarah's taking a dip in the furnace to continue to sculpt a punty for the middle bench. We're gonna go ahead and punty up this handle so that we're able to shape the glass from the opposite side. So for those of you who are curious about how we're going to attach the pan and the handles, in the apron you see Kristen, she is our cold worker here at the museum. So she will be putting all of these components together. It's a secondary process. So it'll happen after all the glass is cold. Now we have attached that punty. We're putting in a jack line inside that punny. Next step is to break it off the first pipe so that we're able to access where it's attached. The part that Ben has sculpted right now is the part that will attach to the skillet. So we've got to put the hole in the handle. Have I got any questions?
So although that glass looks orange or red, it is black, and as it's exposed to the room temperature air, it will become closer to its um, final color. Here we are taking the last gather. This is a grape gather. Deb Churesco will go in, get that gather, strip off the first layer of clear, and then she will scrape off the rest of the clear so that we have the thinnest layer of clear possible. She's pushing down and forcing that clear glass off the end of that pipe. 
which will then take the jacks and isolate that. Those are, she's pulling them off with the tweezers, slightly different. She likes to switch it up. So that tool she just used there was called a diamond shear. It's named as such because of the diamond shape in the center of the shear. So this next part that Deb is working on is quite dramatic. The viewpoint I recommend is up there. Over the next mm, 15 minutes or so, it will get pretty spicy and fun. Now what we've got to do is we've got to flatten our egg white, attach our yolk, and then form it to our metal jig. The metal jig is made to simulate the curvature of the pan that it will eventually be attached to. So over here is where glass making becomes a dance. We've got several things happening in one point that all need to happen in quick concession because temperature is key. So Courtney's got to start getting that yolk from its neutral state, about 1,000, maybe 1,200 degrees. He's got to run it over to that glory hole, heat it up. Meanwhile, Nick is working on getting that egg white really nice and hot to the point where we are able to pull it off that pipe and stretch it onto the kiln shelf, right? So that's gotta be super hot. We have to make sure we don't accidentally shock that yolk because if we go from the garage, that neutral point into that glory hole without doing a preheating cycle, we can uh, shatter the glass. It would probably explode. For those of you just coming in, we're about to uh, see something really fantastic over yonder. Yes. It, this is it. This is the fun part. Now remember everyone, after we complete this egg, we will be taking a survey as to what type of egg you prefer to eat. We've got four choices, hard boiled, scrambled, poached, fried. So it's really tough to think about. There is no right answer, there is no wrong answer.
So when the glass is really hot, we say the glass is spicy. We're getting the glass really nice and spicy right now so that it drips off that pipe onto that kiln shelf and it will remain hot enough to attach our yolk. That is a spicy egg. Remember, we love drama. Got to have nice sparks. We jab it on. We smoosh it to make sure that there's a really solid connection. So there is more drama to be had. Now we've got to use the metal jig to shape it. Remember, we want our egg to be dripping off that pan. So now we're drooping it here. This egg might be over easy, but it was not easy to make. I'll be here all day. Now we're working on the process of flashing down our egg. So we're putting heat right in that yolk, right where it's attached to that pipe, so that we can ensure that there's ample thermal shock to make sure that our egg breaks off exactly where we want it to break. So you can see Courtney has now suited up. He will be loading that egg where our other two eggs are inside of our top loader kiln. We preheat our Kevlar gloves so that we don't accidentally shock that glass. So what's happening now with the glass is we are ensuring that it's all cohesive temperature. We've added heat, now we add water to really make that glass upset, make sure it breaks exactly where we want it to. Vibrations are then sent up the pipe and into the annealer this will go. Can we go ahead and give visiting artist Deb Teresco a round of applause? Deb came all the way from New York. Some might recognize the name from season one of Blown Away. Blown Away is the Netflix series similar to British Bake Off. She won the very first season. Thank you, everybody. Glad you appreciate that amazing egg. Now the survey. Fried, hands. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, fourteen and a half, sixteen, 
15, wait, how do you count? What comes after? Okay, 15 and a half, 16. Whew, that's my fave. But it's not the most versatile. So next up is hard boiled. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five. Five. So the key here is that the hard boil is more of a survi survival egg. It's like you're on the trail, you pull out your, it's much more versatile, but the fried egg, mm, okay. So now, poached. It's like taking a swim, an egg taking a swim. One, two. There's two kids over there with poached. Four, five, kids count as two, so that's seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. <laughs> That's 11. And now, what was the final? Scramble. That was put in at the last minute. Scrambled. One, two, three, four, five. That was not a robust one. Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay, well, fried eggs have it. It's like the, what's that, that musical, the, the Jets and the Sharks, the fried and the poached. Have to battle it out, West Side Story. Thank you, everybody. Well, it turns out fried egg is the most popular, and I'm with you guys. Thanks for coming. They're finishing the handle over here. Now I'm gonna give the microphone back to where it belongs. So now we are finalizing our last handle before our break. Uh, we're opening up and sculpting the inside hole for the handle. Like so. Some of you might recognize the tool that Ben is using right now. You've all been using it wrong the whole time. It's actually for glass blowing. You might know it as a butter knife, but glass had it first.
So right now you are able to see in real time the color transformation as the glass becomes exposed to the room temperature air and that cold tool, it becomes closer to the final color, which is black. When it first comes out of that reheating furnace, it's nice and orange. We've got a lot of heat, hot enough to sculpt. And then as soon as it all kind of gets that black color, we know it's too cold, back into the reheating furnace. Remember, all of the glass that is on the floor and that we are sculpting has to be at least 1,000 degrees. Otherwise, it will get too cold, shatter, and break. So right now, Sarah is strategically heating up the very end that we want to move, we want to sculpt which means the backside is getting less heat. So every once in a while, you'll see Gabe with that fluffy torch heating up that backside. That's in order to enable a more even, more consistent distribution of heat throughout the entire sculpture. If we were to pay no attention to that punty, if we weren't to use the fluffy torch at all, it would absolutely be where the piece broke off. Does anyone have any questions for me? Cool. You can see now we're building up heat in the middle of that handle. We always want to have the most heat where we want the glass to move. So what's most likely going to happen is we're going to elongate that handle.
any questions for me? The eggs are in the oven. No, but really, they're baked. Uh, but we made them earlier today. Will you be making more eggs after lunch? So we'll make more eggs after lunch. So into the annealer they will go, and they'll stay there until that annealer is full, and then they'll all get sent down. Thank you. I think the, <laughs> I just love microphones. <laughs> so the, I think the key to success of this project, since it's being assembled outside of the hot shop, is making variations so that you can play with them and see which size and form works best. And so we're making many handles today and many eggs. The egg's going to be dripping over the side. So it, it is interesting to see which one works. In your mind, you might think, oh, this is the size. But when you get in the finishing shop, you're like, no, that didn't work. I want, and I want the yolk over here versus over there. Like, so that sort of thing, it's good to have a lot of variations to play with. Thank you. This is visiting artist Deb Churesco, all the way from New York. This was a commission. There will be one frying pan and one egg. Uh, it'll all get assembled and then drove down to San Francisco and then installed. So a funny coincidence I just found myself talking, thinking about, is that apparatus in which Sarah is using to move the glass in and out of our reheating furnace is also called a yoke.
So the question is, are they going to be attaching the handle to the pan? Yes, but not in the hot shop. It'll be a secondary process where it will go to the cold shop and get assembled. Are you referring to the, the torch? The torch is allowing for us to heat the back side of the glass. The glass is inside the reheating furnace. The hottest point will always be the farthest back. We need to make sure that all of the glass stays nice and toasty. So we use the torch to bring heat back to the back side. We want even heat distribution but you can see by the difference in the orange color all the way to black in the back, that again, that handle, that farthest point that's inside the reheating furnace does get hottest fastest. So now we've finished the sculpting process for this handle. We're going to begin the process of flashing down the piece. Whenever we put the glass back inside the reheating furnace, that's a flash. So over the process of maybe three to four flashes, we'll make sure that the whole glass object is evenly heated. We're also going to start building up heat right where that punty is so that we can cause thermal shock. So we're building up a lot of heat right where that clear glass is. That's our punty. Gabe is suited up. He's got his Kevlar gloves on. This will allow for him to touch the glass. Now we apply water to create thermal shock right where we were heating it up. When glass goes from really hot to really cold, it breaks. So we're using that to break it exactly where we want it. We could give them a round of applause. That is our third handle of the day. Into the annealer it goes, and that's where it will stay until we're ready to call it for the day. And it, over a course of eight and a half hours, it will go from 950 degrees to room temperature. And that is it, y'all. We get a one hour lunch, and it starts now-ish. If you're still around, we will be continuing this process after our lunch break. And thanks for coming to the museum. Does anyone have any last minute questions for me? Cool. See you in about an hour.
Welcome everyone to the Museum of Glass. We're happy you are here. In the hot shop today, we have visiting artist Deb Cheresco, all the way from New York. She will be completing a commission project where she's making a skillet, as you can see on the screen, with an egg flowing out of it. In the middle, we are going to be making this top part. On the pedestals, you can see we've already made the pan. This morning, we made the longer handle. And this afternoon, we're making the squarish handle. Meanwhile, Deb and her team will be continuing to make eggs. For those of you who were here earlier, you saw we made the yolk, then the egg white. We sculpted it to uh, a jig that was in similar shape to our skillet and then box it in the annealer. So, so far in the annealer, we've got three long handles, three eggs. We'll continue to make more eggs just because you can never have enough and making the secondary handle. So now Gabe is heating up the end of that pipe. We need to preheat that pipe so that when we go into our furnace, we're able to pick up that glass. That furnace he's about to take a dip in holds about 1,000 pounds of glass, runs at 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit, and is powered 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's powered by natural gas and forced air. He will be taking at least th three dips. So we're gonna let that first dip cool so that when we go back into the furnace, it doesn't all slide off the end of the pipe. If at any point you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Here's the second dip. So each time he goes in and takes a dip, he's able to gather more and more glass because the amount of glass he's starting with increases. Now he's rolling in black frit. This is how we are matching the color of the pan and the other handle we've already constructed. You can see it starts off really dark, but then as it's exposed to that heat, it becomes closer to that orange color. It's getting the radiant heat from the glass, heating up and melting into the surface. The question is, why isn't the rod too hot to hold? This machine, Gabe is at right now is called our pipe cooler. It's essentially a water fountain that we use to periodically cool the pipe. Although we don't have as much radiant heat as you might imagine, we do periodically cool down the pipe. You'll also notice that when we're reheating the glass, we're not sticking the pipe that far in there. So that ensures that only a certain amount of that pipe is getting hot. You can tell how much of the pipe gets too hot by the color. It's called a heat patina. As metal is heated up, it gets a heat patina. Basically, the carbon that is in the ferrous alloy raises to the surface. When it's overheated, it forms scale. But in this case, it's just getting that heat patina. So notice where his front hand is. It's right where that pipe turns back to silver. And he's not looking at the pipe and saying, oh, it's silver here, this is where my hand goes. It's just muscle memory.
So Gabe melted in those first few rolls of black color. Now he's adding more. We want to make sure that this color is really nice and dense. We want it to be solid black, just like this. So we're going to get enough layers of black color on that clear bubble in order to make sure it won't be transparent. For those of you just coming in, welcome to the museum. So you can see in real time as Gabe marvers that black glass, it comes closer to its truer color, that black color. He's shaping the glass in a way that will allow for him to get another layer of clear as a skin on the outside. We want to encase the colored glass in clear because clear is more forgiving. When we go in and use the hot torch, we're not going to burn the clear. It's very it's easier to burn the color. So you see that nice bullet shape he shaped that glass into that allows for him to go take another dip inside the furnace and minimizes his chances of getting bubbles that we don't want. So again, we're allowing our core to cool. We want our core to be closer to 1000 degrees. Right now it's probably about 1500 degrees. And we want to get that cold core so when we go back inside that furnace, all that glass doesn't fall right off. Now the type of gather this is, is a scrape gather. So he'll go inside the furnace. He'll strip off extra glass, and then he'll scrape off the remaining glass on the marver. This is the strip. It strips into our strip-off bucket. We can recycle that glass because it's clear. And now he's scraping off that extra glass. The reason why we go through this process is, again, to make sure we've got clear on the outside to protect that color. The tool he's using here is called a diamond shear, named as such because of the diamond shape on the center of the shear. Here's another pipe cooling moment.
For those of you who haven't been here before, you are able to also walk a full 360. We've got some blueprints of our infamous cone all along the backside there. It also gives you a different perspective of the glass making process. This tool is called a block. For those of you familiar with woodworking terms, this is a green wood, so it has not been fired in a kiln. We do that because this will always live in water. When the block is exposed to the molten glass, a layer of steam from that water burning off prevents the wooden block from sticking to the glass and prevents carbon from getting sucked into that glass. Yeah, for those of you just coming in, we are finishing up a commission for visiting artist Deb Churesco. Here you can see a skillet pan that we made yesterday. This morning we made this portion. And then right now we're making this portion. So all three parts to the pan itself will be cold connected. Je Deb has also been making eggs over on the corner bench. The question is how will we finally connect all three pieces? They'll go into our cold shop. Behind here you can't see it but there is a cold shop. Cold shop refers to glass working in um, a wet environment using diamond as an abrasive to grind the glass. Very similar to using an angle grinder in metalworking. There are angle grinders in glass making. So we'll use an angle grinder, we'll get it to match, and then it'll be glued.
So you can see as that glass cools, it becomes closer to that black color. So essentially what will happen is now we're going to put those sharp angular edges into this piece. So that glass is on a kiln shelf. For those of you just coming in, welcome. We are working on the final components for a commission. Our visiting artist is Deb Churesco. Here in the center bench, we're working on the final handle. On our two pedestals, you can see that we've already made the pan. This morning we made this handle, and right now we're making this angular handle, the front. So you can imagine that we'll be cutting off those two bottom parts and we're just going to have the three legs and the part where we'll cut it off will eventually be attached to the front of one of these glass pans. Now glass will always move with the path of least resistance. So we convince the glass to move by adding more heat into it. So by using that hot torch, we're able to build up that heat and tell that glass to move exactly where we want it to.
So Ben is using a tool called a tagliole in order to really make those edges crispy. Remember, we built up that heat. We told the glass, I want you to move here the most. And now he's really able to make that angular shape. Over here, we have Courtney gathering up some yellow. This will eventually be the yolk of another egg. He'll do about three rolls inside that yellow pigment. You can see as it becomes into contact with that hot glass, it turns that red color. But it will go back to that yellow once it cools down. So he'll take about three gathers of this yellow pigment to make sure we have a nice density of color. And then he will also do a scrape gather or a skin of clear on top of this. So Nick is taking a gather out of our furnace to make a punty. The punty is our way of how we are able to sculpt the glass from the opposite side that it's attached to the pipe right now. So there are devil several different types of punties. Ben called out for a sculpture punty, which means we're going to have a bit more clear glass coming off the pipe. You can see Courtney is using the marver to help shape that yolk. Remember, he's got to get that skin on the outside, so we want to shape it into that nice bullet shape so that when we go inside the furnace, we trap the least amount of air bubbles possible. Ben is now hot torching right where he will eventually be cutting it off this side of the pipe. So he's building up that heat. When glass is of a certain temperature, you're able to cut it with shears. So he's got to make sure the glass is hot enough to do that. Now Ben's using those diamond shears to cut in. We want to have where the glass will eventually break be cinched in as small as possible. 
Now remember, we're making a sculpture punny, so we need more clear glass off the end of the pipe. So Nick is taking another dip in our furnace so that he can then pull some of that glass off the front and we can attach it to the farthest point of the pipe. Now Ben grabs that punty with his tweezers in order to align it. We want to make sure that both pipes are rolling in tandem and that they're absolutely parallel to one another. Now we're going to go ahead and let this punty set up, which means to get stiff or hard. As glass cools, it becomes stiff or hard. And once our punty is strong enough, we'll be able to break it off of the original pipe side. Water is used to create thermal shock on the glass and then vibrations seal the deal. So now that we're on the punty side, we're able to sculpt the two ends. Does anyone have any questions for me? So over on this side bench, Courtney is continuing to shape the yolk. While Ben is finalizing the shape of our front handle.
Can we get eyes on Courtney? So you can see Courtney is putting a jack line in our yolk. He's isolating the mass that will eventually be attached to the egg white. By cinching in right past the pipe, he's able to make sure that the glass will break off at that weakest point, which is that small area. Once he's happy with the shape of that yolk, he'll actually be loading it into our garage. Our garage is this piece of equipment right here in the middle of the shop that allows us to park the glass or to press pause. It keeps the glass hot enough that it won't break, but not so hot that it's flopping around. The garage has a hot side and a cold side. Uh, the hot side is this side. This is a, a ribbon burner that's attached to here. It's also run by natural gas. Hot side, 1,600-ish. Cold side, 1,000-ish. There are doors where we can kind of control how much temperature remains inside there and how much is let out. Now, Nick is making another sculpture punny. This will eventually be attached to the yoke. This is over here, the same process is happening as before. We're attaching that punny. So we want that punny pipe and the yoke pipe to be rolling in tandem.
So this jig was made earlier today here at the Museum of Glass to simulate the curvature of our skillet. So what we're doing is we're matching our front handle curvature to the metal armature that is the same or close to our final curve. This will allow for us to have the most contact for a gluing surface as possible. And can we give our visiting artist, Deborah Churesco, a round of applause. The superstar is on the floor. She's back and ready for more. So we are making eggs over on this side. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Deb Churesco's work, she was season one winner of the Blown Away series on Netflix. She hails from New York and is a meat master. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? So here's the final mm, goal. So we've got our pans that we made yesterday. We've got our back handles that we made earlier today. And we've got the front handles that we've started making. We won't make just one front handle. We'll keep making them till the end of the day so we've got plenty to choose from. We'll also still continue making eggs so we can dial in that curvature. So that's the equivalent of a glass blower mic drop. Does anyone have any questions for me? You can see Gabe has now suited up, which means we're nearing the end of this piece. We're about to break it off. Water is placed on that punty connection to make that glass really upset. Then vibrations are set up. Into the annealer that will go. And at the end of the day, all of the pieces that were made will be sent down over a period of eight and a half hours from about 950 degrees to room temperature. Can we go ahead and give them a round of applause? First piece in the box this afternoon. For those of you who missed it, we are all on the floor for visiting artist Deb Churesco, hailing from New York City. Right now, 
Deb is working on the egg white. Remember, we've got the egg yolk already in the garage, ready to go. So we'll take several more gathers of clear, then we'll start adding on our white colored glass. And then we'll do that same scrape gather as before. Remember, we want a thin layer of clear encasing this colored glass. So Deb is using a wooden block to help shape that glass. That block lives in water. So when it is exposed to the molten glass, a layer of steam forms around it. That's to make sure that the block doesn't stick to the glass. If you were to just keep on rolling, even though you have no more steam developing, something called scuzz would get inside your piece. So now we're starting to apply the white pigment to our mm, clear glass. About five layers of that white powder will be applied to our clear glass mass.
the number of times we're rolling in the pigment is dictated by how much density we want in that color. We want a solid black and a solid white, so we're rolling in that powder several times. You can see here Gabe is actually doing the same thing at the center bench. Has anyone in the room seen Blown Away? Awesome. We've got quite a few uh, contestants from Blown Away in the greater Seattle area. So they're... Uh, So for those of you who haven't seen Blow It Away, it's kind of like the great British bake-off of glass blowing on Netflix. Ten contestants start off and then they knock each other out until there's only one glass blower standing. Apparently they're going to start filming season four here very soon. I've got two questions. What are the suitcases doing? Glass blowers like to keep their tools in the suitcases, so they are personal suitcases. Uh, it's nice because they're hard and probably not going to get penetrated by the sharp tools. The other question is, uh, how will all of these things be attached? So we're going to take our pans we've already made. In here, we've got three eggs. We've got three handles. We're going to size them up, see which ones make the best matches, and then they'll be taken to the cold worker where they will assemble it using Hextall, which is a glass glue. Mm -hmm. And Gabe just grabbed our last gather on our front handle. Now we're doing the scrape.
We've got two questions. The second question's easier, so I'll answer it first. It's essentially, does it matter if the powder or the frit? We're using frit here. We're using powder over there. The difference between the two, frit is larger particulate. Powder is smaller particulate. Does it matter if the powder or the frit leaves a texture? Absolutely it does. So we make sure to melt in all of the texture from our frit or our powder before going and doing our scrape gather. If we were to leave texture or large particles of glass on the outside when we go inside the furnace and take that dip, we would have the potential of trapping bubbles. Sometimes you want to trap bubbles, totally cool. Right now, no bubbles. Second question, why are we deciding to attach it cold rather than to attach it hot? I think it comes down to we're going to have way more success cold because we're able to take the time to look at all of the pieces, make sure that they match perfectly, that they're really well adhered to one another instead of when it's hot, it's really flashy, it's really showy, it's really fun, but it doesn't always lend itself to success. And we've got two days to make this. There's no room for failure. So it was also brought to my attention that we do not have a reheating furnace large enough. So even if we did want to assemble this hot, we can't. It won't fit. So over here in the corner, Courtney and Deb are letting that white glass cool down. We've melted in all of our powder, and now we're getting that cold core so that when we go inside the furnace, all the glass doesn't schlep off. And there is our strip. For those of you who are curious, we are able to recycle the clear glass that lands in that bucket because we know it's just clear. And here we are scraping. 
the glass to the front of the piece. This is the egg white. Inside the garage, we've already got our yolk ready to go. Welcome to the museum. Now Deb is isolating the rest of that clear glass, pulling it off the pipe. This is all extra. We want that layer of clear to be as small as possible. For those of you just coming in, this is our visiting artist, Deb Cheresco, hailing all the way from New York City. For those of you familiar with the Blown Away series, she was our season one winner. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Blown Away, it is similar to the British Bake Off show on Netflix. Hi. So it's about to get really exciting. Right over here would be the best vantage point, just so you know. We're about, I'm sorry, I saw you guys leave and I should have caught you just a second ago. But I promise, if you stay for 10 more minutes, you won't be disappointed. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to flatten that yolk, sorry, flatten that egg white and then attach our yolk. It's fun. There's fire. There's heat. There's drama. So the next step for us to do is to get the egg white. If y'all just coming in want to see something really exciting, you're going to want to go over to that corner. I promise it's worth the walk. So now Nick's got our egg white. He's getting it really nice and toasty inside that reheating furnace. Courtney's got the yolk. He's at the ready. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to let that egg white drip onto that kiln shelf. Deb will then sculpt that egg white, and then we will be attaching our egg yolk. You have 10 minutes. <laughs> we got time. So it's at points like this where glass blowing has been described as a dance will be fairly mm, pronounced because we've got to make sure that Courtney's yolk isn't too cold, it's not too hot, it's like porridge and Goldilocks and Three Bears. And then we want to make sure that Nick's egg white has enough heat so that when we pull it off that pipe, we've still got enough heat that it doesn't crack. So not crazy hot that it's spewing everywhere, but not so cold that we can't accomplish everything we need to do in that singular heat. So we're letting gravity do its job. Now that is a paddle that's soaked in water. We're squishing it. We're getting our egg white really nice and organically formed. We want to make sure it doesn't get stuck to our kiln shelf. So a little paddle action there, a little whoop-dee-doo. Now she grabs the yolk and shoves it onto that egg white to make sure that there is ample connection. So now we're really starting to get cooking. Da -da -dutch. So we're going to go ahead and reheat that egg. Our next step is to take it over to that metal jig. So when glass is really hot, we call it spicy. That is a spicy egg if I ever did see one. I told you there'd be drama, you guys. Look at that. We got flames. We got fire. Throwing glass all around. We've got our own television star at the forefront. Now we got to let that glass set up a little bit so we save our shape.
Now, sometimes when we cut glass, something called a tool mark, where we've tooled the material, is left behind. Now we're using the hot torch to get rid of that tool mark. Now we're beginning the process of flashing down the piece. We want to get that punny really nice and hot so that when we introduce water, thermal shock ensures that it breaks off right there, right where we want it to. Courtney's all suited up, so you know the end is near. We are finishing up this egg steadfast. Now that we've gotten that punty really nice and hot, there's our water. This starts the cracking process of that glass. Vibrations finalize this step. Go ahead and give Deb Teresco a round of applause. That is our fourth egg of the day. That was a good egg. And we're still not in quiche territory because that's six. So you got two more to go before we can make a quiche. So while we're hitting the reset button on our eggs, does anyone have any questions? For those of you who decided to stick by, thank you very much.
For those of you just coming in, welcome to the museum. Today we have visiting artist Deb Cheresco from New York. She's here completing a commission piece. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? This is the piece that we're working on. So yesterday, we made three of these pans. This morning, we made the longer handle. And right now, we're working on the final front handle. Over here in the corner, we have our leading lady making eggs to go inside the skillet. Right now, she has let her core cool to take a nice gather of glass on top of our yolk. What she will be doing is taking a scrape gather so we want the thinnest amount of clear on top of our yellow as possible. So we're gonna go into that furnace, take a nice dip, strip off the extra glass, and then scrape the, remi the remaining clear. You can see she's pushing down to get that clear to go to the front. So now she's isolating that clear so that she'll be able to take her diamond shears and trim the rest of that off. At the center bench, we're finishing up our geometrical front handle, getting it ready to box. Gabe is all suited up. He's got Kevlar gloves, face shield, and a hoodie to help him be protected from the heat. He will be loading it into this top loader right over here. We're using water to shock the glass and then vibrations are sent up to finalize the break. Can we go ahead and give them a round of applause? That is our second front handle. So into that annealer it will go and over the course of eight and a half hours, it will come down from about 950 degrees to room temperature. So Gabe is starting our next handle. We're gonna be doing that same thing again so that we have plenty of choices during the final construction. Over in the corner, Deb Cheresco and Courtney are working on shaping that yoke. That tool is called a block. It's made out of green wood and lives in water.
Deb Ceresco is now cutting in the jack line. The tool in which she's using is called the jack. So she's cinching in right where eventually it will be broken off of that pipe. So we want it really nice and succinct. Now Gabe has started the coloring process over here. He's rolling that clear glass in black so that we're able to pigment that glass. I know. So the number of layers of that black pig pigmented glass determines how dense we want that color or how dense that color will be. And we want it really dense. We want it to match our black pans. So we're going to roll inside that black frit several times. So over on the side here, what they're doing is attaching the punty. So we want our original pipe and our punty side to be sp spinning in tandem. And what this does is it allows for us to sculpt the glass from the opposite side, the side that is now attached to the original pipe.
So they just finished the last yoke. Into the garage it will go. And now we will start the egg white process. Meanwhile, in the center bench, Gabe has finished his color application and is waiting to get his skin of clear for his scrape gather. So now Deb is working on gathering up the clear core for our egg white. She'll most likely do three dips, maybe four. Yeah. Absolutely. The question was about the color of our pans. This was applied with color bar, which is a slightly different process, but same deal. It has a clear core and then the black color is on the outside. Mm -hmm. Have a good one. Thanks for stopping by.
So here Deb is shaping that clear glass with a block. This does two things. It cools it down and also puts it in a shape that is more manageable for gathering more glass.
For those of you just coming in, welcome to the museum. Here on the hot shop floor, we have visiting artist Deb Churesco. Can we go ahead and play the commission slide, please? This is what we're finishing up today. So in the center bench, we have that front handle. And over on the side, Deb is making eggs. Thank you. Right now, Courtney is rolling into white glass. We've already made our yoke. Our yoke is inside the garage. And now we're starting on our egg white. So he will roll, roll inside the white pigmented glass and then melt that color in and repeat that process five times to get the desired color density. Meanwhile, over here, we're working on that front handle. That blackish surface is a kiln shelf. And now we're building up heat on the inside of that handle so that we're able to get nice sharp edges that closely match our example. Hello, welcome. Sounds good. So for those of you who, hasn't, who haven't seen, we've got our two black pans on either pedestal over here. There's a third one on the table. And before we made those, we made them in clear. They're over there, one's on the cart. So now what we're doing is we're sh we've gathered up all of our color. We're done with that step. Now we're shaping our white glass to be dipped in the furnace to get our skin of clear. We want a nice pointed shape so that when we go into the furnace, we have the least likely chance of trapping air bubbles.
So right now we're letting that core cool. We need the core to be really nice and cool so that when we go inside the furnace, we don't schlep all that glass inside the furnace. We want it to stay attached to that pipe. So by having a cold core, we're able to do that. We're also going to be scraping off any extra glass. So we, it's really vital that we have the structural integrity of a cold core. Now Deb is going to take a scrape gather. Remember that furnace is about 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, so she went ahead and cooled the pipe. Now she's stripping some of that extra glass. And she'll continue to get off any extra clear by pushing the glass to the front. Meanwhile, in the center here, we're about to transfer that handle onto the punty. Now Deb was able to use gravity and the viscosity of that molten glass to allow it to fall off. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it or to want to see it again, your best vantage point is going to be right at that corner as we begin to assemble. So we're going to work on getting our egg white really nice and hot. We're going to work on getting our yolk out of that garage into the glory hole and then we're going to do the final assembly. It'll be worth your while, I promise.
So here we're using a wet newspaper to help sculpt that glass. We want a very specific shape that, so that when we go to drop it onto the kiln shelf, we know exactly how it's going to happen and where that glass is going to flow. So some of you might be wondering why we're cooling the end of that bubble, or excuse me, by the end of that white. When we're in the reheating furnace, the part that's farthest in the hole will always get hotter than the rest. When we're coming out, when it's super hot, we're on the verge of potentially sticking to our kiln shelf. So by cooling that end, we kind of mitigate that. So this will be the heat. In this heat, we will both pull that white glass off and put it on the kiln shelf. We'll sculpt it using a paddle to smush it down. And then we will be hot attaching our egg yolk.
So now what we're doing is we're building up heat right in that punty area to make sure that it breaks exactly where we want it to. So now we're cutting in that jack line, preheating our Kevlar sleeves. So now we're letting that piece cool down to the point where it's not going to absorb any of the texture from the kiln. Meanwhile, our final front handle just went into the box. Water is added to, to cause that thermal shock. Awesome. Let's go ahead and give a final round of applause. Put a fork in it. It is dinner time. We are ready to go. Visiting artist Deb Churesco. So for those of you who don't work for the museum, it is after close. Thank you. I hope you had a wonderful visit, and until next time.